And there was like some cigar king in the front row, like, dressed all in white, about 80 years old, with a cowboy hat on. And he fell asleep. He fell asleep while we were playing. The cigar king. Hello everyone and welcome to the Stage Left Podcast with Liam Gallagher's super talented and hilarious keyboardist, uh, Christian Madden. Um, after meeting in Barcelona and recording our Dan McDougall episode, uh, Christian and his wife Kate invited us up to the quaint Clitheroe um, and we uh, spent a fun day not only recording the interview but going for a few drinks at local establishments uh, and uh, having a jam in the end to, to like to some might say, rocking chair, rock and roll star, um, some of which you hear throughout the interview actually, um, including uh, Christian and Kate's two sons walking in halfway through through uh, for what it's worth and, and singing along which was which was good fun um thanks to john at armyourears.com for the audio cleanup and editing on this um, and please check out further episodes uh, with the likes of uh, richard fortas of guns and roses uh, tony visconti on producing david burry's final album black star uh, steve cropper uh, wolfgang flow of craft work and um, stuart lee on his creative processes and of course oasis guitarist gem archer's first interview in five years as well as russ pritchard um mike rowe uh, from noel gallagher's high flying birds uh, and of course dan mcdougall who was on a recent episode who's Liam's drummer uh, you can check all of those out at thestagelefpodcast.com follow us on Twitter at thestagelefpod uh, like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash thestagelefpodcast um, our new website has been um, rejigged and uh, redesigned uh, by Alex Soikens so thanks to that Alex uh, you can go and see that now um, and if you want to buy us a beer for our troubles uh, you can do we do this away for Uh, from two other jobs um, we do this for free to provide free educational content for young musicians but if you want to buy us a beer you can do that at stageleftpodcast.com we'd really appreciate it okay we hope you enjoy the episode this is Christian Madden would you play a bit of rock and chair? Okay, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. The podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Today we have a man who is exactly that, as our guest today is not only a founding member of cult prog rock band uh, The Earlies, but has collaborated with the likes of Steve Cropper, Plan B, Cherry Ghost, Paul Heaton, Emmy the Great, and currently Tinkles the Ivories as part of uh, Liam Gallagher's band. Um, as well as this, our our guest today has put out some incredible instrumental uh, material under his own name, um, including complex and meticulously designed pieces that challenge and stretch the listener, uh, as well as some outright fucking tunes, which we'll be discussing today. Um, today, you will get a unique insight and funny tales from the man himself, Christian Madden. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Christian. How's it going? Thank you. That was a brilliant intro. Absolutely. That made, that made me sound worth having on. I like <laughs> so um, since we met in Barcelona, you've done some further gigs and you went to South America and some of those gigs look pretty wild. Yeah. Amazing audiences. Probably some of the biggest I've been in front of, I think. It was like those Lollapaloozas were 100,000, I think. Um, and the, like a football crowd, yeah. They sang every guitar riff and just moved the whole way through. And they were sober. They were Right. They weren't even serving beer at those, so... Really? Why? Is that a, just a thing? I don't know. Do? I don't know. It looks like a lot of beer. But we be would never. Yeah, it. we would never get that loose off nothing. Yeah. Know? We we need it, don't we? <laughs> but they they were just yeah, genuinely having fun. Yeah. What the high- Genuinely what? happy. Yeah, yeah. What were the highlights of that particular stretch of gigs? Um, let me think. I mean, there were some days off that contained some real highlights, and I probably. Go on. Uh, no, I'm not talking about them. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, yeah. That, that, the um the Sao Paulo Lollapalooza was amazing, which is the one that's the one where Liam got up on stage with the killers at the end of it. Oh, but that was a really good gig. Uh, 
The first one in Buenos Aires. Oh no, sorry, the second one in Buenos Aires. The first one was another sound issues one. Um, then I really enjoyed going to Chile as well. That's a great place, Santiago. But we ended up. That was one that Liam cut short because he sort of lost his voice. So we had a bit of a bad patch in the middle where we had to cancel a gig and stuff. Just resulted in a lot of time off. But yeah, yeah it was a fun place to go to, definitely. What's the most um, extreme examples of audiences differing in the way they receive the music on tours when you travel the world? With Liam? Or yeah. With, uh, with, well, Liam, with anyone, but yeah. Well, it's a bit, it's always artificially skewed with Liam because British people seem prepared to travel anywhere on earth to watch him. Yeah. But South America, it was like, that was a genuine South American audience at every gig, but like, we've played in Dubai and it felt like we were playing to 10,000 British people. Right. Certainly felt like that entire European tour, you'll have noticed yourself in yeah. Barcelona, it's like the top, I don't know, maybe like the last 20% of tickets go to British people who've got a cheap easy jet flight over right. there. Yeah. Everywhere in Europe seemed to be like that. Australia, we had loads of people who were over there watching the cricket, watching us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel wildly different everywhere, yeah. What about a place like Japan and stuff like that? Do they... Are they, are they a bit more reserved? In the past, you've had people on saying the audience is a bit more reserved, or is it pretty wild? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're pretty wild. The uh, South Koreans are the craziest of the, of the Asian um, audiences we've had, I think. Uh, we supported the Foo Fighters, was it, in, in Seoul? But that just felt like it was a Liam gig. They were just absolutely on side from the off. Um, but yeah, th those countries are all great. I mean, that's like being in the Beatles or something when you go over there, you know. Uh, everybody's waiting at the airport and all that. Obviously not for me, but you know, <laughs> you can sort of, yeah, get a little bit of it by proxy. And how's it been then? So you've been in the band, what, a... Uh, about a year, I think. Yeah, about, about a year. last March, uh, we started rehearsing in London. So we did six weeks rehearsing and then we're into the gigs and were those how many of those rehearsals were before Liam got involved was it a case you were we saying? did two weeks without him uh, but at that stage they were kind of being sort of um, they were keeping the cards close to the chest about the album at that stage so we started off rehearsing Oasis songs and then um, and then he came down at the end of the second week and had a listen to us to check that it was alright and he seemed to be into it you know and then uh, and then the week after we started looking at uh like the the first few of the of the new album, you know. And how did I mean you you were just kind of saying that um, the incredible stat, but you said like over one hundred and fifty people, you reckon probably auditioned for the gig and and not yeah, not for so, keyboards. I mean, they, 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 I think they had a, a two day audition thing where um, people were coming in in fours, right? Uh, and they thought uh, like maybe maybe five so I don't know they were putting people together in different oh. lineups and they'd have to play a couple of Oasis songs and so Drew and Mike got picked from that I think everybody got filmed it sounds like it was I, I would have definitely not made it through that process <laughs> I think you had to sit there on camera and you know say what you'd done in the past and I don't know you know look good and all that and, yeah um, but they had so Mike said that uh he, he was quite lucky because he ended up in there with Drew and and his other housemate was on drums. So that they, they all went in as a package and they all, you know, they learnt them together and they looked all right. You could potentially get stitched up with who you end up yeah. in there with. I suppose if you end up with a bad drummer behind you, it's going to throw everyone's audition off. Isn't it? So have you done auditions like that before? In, in that I have set? never auditioned for anything. Really? Uh, no. Or word of mouth, right? Yeah, yeah, which is quite fortunate, I think, because, yeah, like I say, I think I would fail on an audition. Why? I don't know. I don't think I look that great. I <laughs> sound like a farmer and, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, but you have to grow to love me. It's not going <laughs> to It's not gonna happen instantly. But obviously you've got like an amazing back catalogue of work, which we're going to be uh, tapping into uh, in a bit. Um, so how did you get the gig then? So they obviously did these auditions and they hadn't quite found a keyboardist. So yeah, um... So I had one friend, uh, Matt Steele, who plays for the brand new Evies. He went along to those original auditions and he said he definitely didn't get it. And on his way out, he said to the guy running the auditions, you should get Christian Madden in. And then I, so I heard about that and I was like, well, that'd be good. But anyway. And then the next thing I heard was this guy, Joe Clegg, who plays drums for Ellie Golding. 
And it turned out Dan had got in touch with him asking um, if he knew any keyboard players. And I'd just been talking to Joe on Facebook the day before about meeting up, so I was fresh in his mind. So when Dan asked him, he recommended me. And then Debbie, Liam's girlfriend, checked me out and found out that I'd played with Cherry Ghost. So then she rang Cherry Ghost and asked if I was all right. <laughs> and, uh, and of yeah. course, the singer from Cherry Ghost, the main songwriter, Simon Aldridge, wrote uh, For What It's Worth. Is that right? He did, yeah, he did. He sort of put it under a pseudonym, uh, I think, but yeah. He's a, he's a great songwriter. He's a good songwriter, yeah. I mean, he just he, he, he keeps getting better at it as well. I think he's sort of... Um, he's been doing a lot of writing to order for different pop acts and stuff like that. Mm. He's, he's, he's just streamlined the process. He's very quick now at doing it, you know. And how long were you playing in Cherry Ghost for? I stepped in when his old keyboard player joined Miles Kane's band. So right. that must have been about 2012 or something like that. And um, and then I ended up doing the third album. I also played on the Out Cold album, which is the one he did in between the second yep. and third albums. Um, but I knew him from back in the days when I was in the earlys, and he got signed around the same time as us. We actually did some things on the radio together. We did um, we always used to do Mark Riley's Christmas parties in Manchester. Right. And uh, I think we did a cover of a, a low Christmas song on there. What's it called? Just like Christmas. Right. Like, do you know what? Do you not know oh, like Anyway. Um, and then we actually started recording a country album as well together, like the Earlies and Cherry Ghost. Nice. Never went anywhere, but it was good. Yeah? Still got the recordings of that? No, I think I dropped the hard drive that that was on. Oh, man. <laughs> I have an MP3 of it somewhere, unmixed. Good though. He sounds magic, whatever he does, Simon. He, so. He's a talented guy. What's his unique qualities? Do you think, if you're a young musician and you were working with Simon, what what would you learn working with him that you might not learn from working with anyone else? He's got an amazing work ethic. Um, you know, if you're rehearsing with him, he doesn't like a, you know, he's not always taking breaks for brews and snacks and stuff like that. He's just. If the rest of the band want to go and eat their dinner, he'll wait for them and play the guitar. You know, it's like he's really focused. Um, he's very, he's an intelligent, well-educated guy. He's literary, you know. He he reads a lot. He pulls in influences from a lot of different sources, you know. Interesting. Um, yeah. And how has the uh, band um, evolved um, playing together since a year to now? How has it changed? Has it evolved? Um. <sighs> I don't know, we, 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 we probably listen to each other a lot more than we did. Probably everybody's a bit more comfortable about what they can put in of themselves into the different things. Um, you know, it, I'd, have to, I'd have to listen back, really. But I would imagine we were all a bit petrified at first, especially knowing that you're under the microscope and that Oasis fans are going to just be coming along and hating you for not being Oasis, you know. <laughs> But like, yeah. and how have you dealt with that? How, how have you guys? Dealt with it, it's not as directed at me because nobody ever cared about the keyboard players, you know. <laughs> uh, but like, um, I think I think if you're on guitar or, or drums, you're gonna you're gonna meet a lot of criticism from other people who can play those Oasis songs in their bedroom yeah. and therefore feel fit to criticise you, you know. Um, I don't think Drew takes too much flack. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the best thing is to ignore all that and just, yeah, get on with it, really. Li- it. Liam's always been happy with it, with everything that everyone's doing, so that's all that really counts. And how do you feel about collaborating with Liam? What's he like to work with as a... As a... Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's a lovely chap, really. He's a, he's a good laugh. Uh, he, 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 do, he doesn't really, you know, he leaves it to us. He's got faith that we're all good enough to... You know, to learn the parts and embellish them where necessary or whatever. You know, I mean, he, he Did, does. Does he, he does. pull you in? Does he pull your reins in sometimes if you're thinking, oh, put, put not with me. In. When I first met him, he actually just said to me, "I, I don't know anything about keyboards, so just do whatever you want." Which is, you know, he's he's always been a bit harsh on himself with stuff like that. But, um, he, he, I mean, he doesn't really zone in on that either. He's been in a guitar band since he was whatever, yeah. 17, and that, 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 he, he listens to guitars a bit, and he listens to himself, because he just cares about whether he's doing a good job or not, yeah. So I guess from your point of view, you play some like really, really kind of complex stuff in the past, I've, I've been listening to the last few days, and um, you, I guess you're having to rein yourself in a little bit to, to do, do what the song needs? Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to hear a keyboard player 
you know, putting prog licks all over Oasis songs. So. Might work. <laughs> I'd make it work, but it'd be a fast track to pissing people off, definitely. <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, we're in uh, we're in Clitheroe at the moment, and um, you grew up near here in Burnley, is that right? Yeah. The yeah. other side of the hill, yeah. Yeah. What were your early motivations as a musician? Did you initially start on keyboards and were you trying to be a keyboardist or was it just... Yeah, I, I never wanted to really play anything else. Um, so everybody I meet now, younger musicians, seem to play everything. And I mean, good on them, you know, but like back then you just pick one and did it. <laughs> so Dan plays everything. Yeah, yeah. he does. Yeah, that's right. And uh, how old were you when you started playing keyboards? I, I, I got like a little portable keyboard when I was about 11 or so um, and sort of had, you know, a bit of basic lessons learning um, merrily we roll along and things yeah. like that. Uh, but I, I only started properly playing when I was about 14 or 15 when I got an Hammond organ. So like... Um, Why did you get the Hammond? What was it? Was it because... Well, my, mom had, my dad's a musician. Right. I and uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd had this night, I, I was in that thing of, you know, hanging around on street corners, drinking Kestrel Super Strength. <laughs> and I'd come home one night and they'd recorded a Sounds of the 60s for me and they just, they showed me um, a video of Keith Emerson playing uh, America with the Nice. And also Joe Cocker and the Grease Band doing Bow of Little Help from my friends. And they were just like, uh, that's a Hammond organ and that's what you need to get. And so, like, the day after, I went down to the local Dawson's and just asked if they had one, and they did. So I got a Hammond and Leslie. Nice. Got it home, and just it was depressing that I actually couldn't play it. I think I'd been playing on a little keyboard with auto rhythms, and yeah. everything sounded sort of good on that, and then got a Hammond and realised I actually couldn't play. And I started learning properly, really, you know. How? With lessons, or...? No, I was just listening, really, at that time, watching a lot of people... Struggling, you know. I, I listen to a lot of Doors. That was a really yeah. good starting point for keyboards because it's not, it's not mega complicated, but it's always good and tasteful, um, and and it's really easy to hear. Listening to Hammond parts that go through a Leslie, it can be a bit more difficult to listen to Fox Continental's sort of a bit more harsh and yeah. brittle sounding, but you can definitely hear everything that's going on. Yeah. Um, then I started listening to more and more different Hammond players and stuff. My dad had a covers band at the time, and it, in fact, the keyboard player who was like my dad's best friend at the time got murdered, and um, Shit. and they had one gig left, and they needed a keyboard player, and they, they asked a few players to do it, and everybody kept um, backing out of it, and then at the last minute, I ended up doing it. I was only fifteen, wow. but then I started gigging like round local pubs and working men's clubs, and I wasn't good enough to do it, but I sort of just. Um, got dragged up to speed really quickly, you know. How? So when, you, when you're doing last-minute gigs or, or high-pressure gigs and you haven't got the material now down straight away, what's your approach, what's your process to get that down as quick as possible? Well, at that stage, I was having to learn on the gigs. And it was so uh, that, that, that was really good because I, I, cause it was my dad and it was his friends and it, and it was local pubs and stuff. I sort of got that, that, that kind of pressure, but in a really forgiving environment where... It wouldn't stick with you forever. I mean... But it would have been a big deal to you, I think, probably. It was at the age. time. Like, Nowadays, it'd be on like, YouTube or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. And it's like... So it, it's kind of... It's difficult for young people now to be able to sort of have a bit of a pressure in a forgiving environment, you know. That was good for it then. And then, as uh, you know, so I, I got really comfortable with, like, improvising in a situation, sort of... Your ear gets trained, you start being able to hear different chord progressions and things like that and um you know just being able to think in a slightly pressured situation or stuff like your gear going wrong something breaking yeah you know a lead being out and just having to sort things at the gig you know so get, so get good into the that. deep end really. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so by the time i got on to sort of um being in a signed band and working for high profile people i had all that stuff sorted and then it was just whatever was new about the music or, you know. And were your parents really happy for you to, to go into the music industry? Were they happy yeah. for you to Yeah. I mean, my that? parents, like, you know, um, whenever I was sort of short of money or looking for a job or anything, my mum and dad would actively say, don't, don't do it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Something will turn up. Nice. Fine, you know. Uh, 
And they're not rich or anything, but they would do anything to help me at the time, you know. So. That's brilliant, because my next question was about, did you have to kind of juggle, not, you know, having to do a real job in inverted commas and, and, the, and the pressures of bills and stuff like that, but I guess you've, they gave you that no, I got I got to stay there, you know, um, and then I, I went to university in my sort of 20s in London. Yeah, would you? I went to the LSE. So right. totally unrelated to music, but I right. thought I'll just get something else done. What's sorry? What's it? LSE? London School of Economics. Oh, economics, right? Okay, right. Um, Is that a bit of a safety net for you? I guess if the music. I, I, I did sociology, so that would have. Oh, been, okay. That would have been nothing of a safety net. Really. Right. But, um, <laughs> it was good fun. I had a cracking time down there. I thought I'll go to London and I'll meet some other musicians and I'll get into the scene down there, and I didn't. You know, I was hanging around with people who are now all working in politics or banking or <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I made a lot of really good friends there. I had a lot of fun, and then at the end of my second year, the earlys just started out of nowhere picking a bit of traction up, and yeah. we got a record deal in my third year. So sort of scraped through the exams at the end. But I was already touring by then. Wow. I went back and you know did a few bits of exams. Before we get to the earlys, um, what was the name of the first song you ever wrote? Um, I never really considered myself uh, a songwriter, so I started really? working with other people on things. Oh, I think I did a, a tune, me and my mate Maz did a tune called Pink Accident when we were at school. <laughs> what was that about? Can't remember. <laughs> and what's your kind of, um, what's your what's your view on that piece of music now? Is it good? Is it? No, is definitely it? not. <laughs> and, uh, we wrote a song about our geography teacher as well while we were at school. Which, uh, Was it complimentary? Yeah, it was all right, actually. It just said that he was a nice man. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was pretty uncontroversial, you know. So, we, yeah, we were definitely trying to bounce ideas around. But then, like, I only fell into, like, writing stuff with other people, um, you know. Because in the early days, we had two, two non-musicians, so it was like, um, they, they, you know, they needed somebody to be able to come and bring some chords and... <laughs> What was so? But they were vocalists, were they? Or? No, no, computer guys. Oh, with, oh yeah, right, sorry, sample based cool. musicians. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so tell us about um, the early forming. So you were founding member of those, and yeah, we all, we all. Um, there was a, a studio in Manchester called the School of Sound Recording, and we all. Um, I was in a band that was sort of recording there, and John Mark is from Texas, but he came. Uh, he, he he came over to learn about production in England. He actually phoned somebody up in Sheffield because he thought Sheffield was the haven of British synthesizer music. Right. And he phoned somebody up at a college there and they said, oh, don't come to Sheffield. You want to go to Manchester instead. So he went to Manchester, met him there, and we started working on bits of things. And I don't think I even thought any of it was good, but I really liked John Mark and his friend Giles. Um... And so I'd go in and play for hours on end and they would sort of chop up bits of what I was doing and then suddenly they started producing things that sounded good. And then they brought in another guy from America, uh, Brandon, the singer. And then it started turning into something that sounded a bit commercial. And uh, we, we actually put out a few seven inches of our own, which was, at the time, I think that was a bit of a... Everybody does that now. Yeah, that yeah, was quite rare right. then. Yeah. And it meant that it got reviewed... And it got uh, played by DJs and stuff like that. Whereas and it got good reviews, like uh, you know, the, yeah, you were quite critically acclaimed, I'd say, looking back at some of the stuff. Yeah, by the time we got uh, we got signed by uh, like an offshoot of Warner Brothers, um, and by the time they were putting our things out, we were sort of getting, you know, good broadsheet reviews. Didn't really translate into much, you know. I think the, the first album sold all right, and the second one sold worse. What were you trying to achieve artistically with the album? Um, I, don't, I don't think... I mean, probably John Mark, um, who's one of the, the sampler guys, sort of, he's, a, he's a really good electronic musician, and he was trying to... I think at the start he was trying to make something that sounded like a band but didn't actually use any instruments. He was thinking of doing something that was all sample-based. Mm. And then gradually he sort of saw that I had this network of musicians from Burnley and it had actually been really interesting to do something enormous and ambitious um, with lots of harmonies. And so like, yeah, like a classic psychedelic pop band, really. But, you know, 
because it's still remaining pop. Yeah, um, and, and you're, accessible. Yeah, it was accessible. I mean, uh, you, your role as well. I've, I've seen like a couple of live performances, and um, you were the kind of not the conductor per se, but you were introducing songs and that kind of thing. So, why uh, you? What? How did you? How did you feel about doing that kind of stuff? I just sort of yeah blundered into it really, and uh, I mean, it probably wasn't the best for it. You know, it would have been better if everything was in an American voice, uh, <laughs> and then everybody would have perceived it as being like <laughs> like. Mercury Rev or something, you know, and uh, instead they just had this oafish Lancashire guy, and um, you know, I was I was always drunk at the time then as well, so it, yeah, probably didn't benefit us, but you know, everybody on stage was laughing, so I thought this is going really well. <laughs> Do you know what I, I I urge listeners to check out? There's um yesterday, uh, Christian, you know, I had a horrendous uh, train journey, and just when I was about to pull my hair out, um, I I I, I found a, a video. If you guys playing a gig, it's about 35 minutes long on YouTube, um, and it's a great show. And, you know, even in that moment of pulling my hair out, it kind of took me completely away from what was going on, and, and I enjoyed every single minute of it. It's a great show. It was the Avo session. Avo oh, session. that, yeah. yeah. That was like a... They, they, they do a lot of those, don't they? In right, Switzerland. yeah. Um, I think it's like a cigar company or something. Really? It's, it's like <laughs> a really good, really good gig filmed properly. Free cigars for everybody. <laughs> uh, and there was like some cigar king in the front row, like, dressed all in white, was about 80 years old, with a cowboy hat on. And he fell asleep. He fell asleep <laughs> while we were playing. The cigar king. So we rocked him gently. Yeah, it was a good gig, that. Yes, it's great. I, I urge people to. Uh, it was check sort it out. of like the, the absolute height of luxury. There was champagne everywhere and cigars. And then the day after, we went to America to do a tour and we were in a. RV with eight of us sleeping on top of each other in tiny bunks and all that. So it was like, yeah, we came crashing down to earth the day after, basically. Right. What were your highlights of, of playing with the earlies? What What are your kind of fondest memories looking back? At um, the, the the first gigs were really brilliant. Uh, when you when you feel like you're about to take over the world and it's all going great and sort of like being at university and getting my first like. Single of the week in the Guardian and the Independent on the same day. Wow! One of my housemates bringing back the reviews, and then um, the first time we played at Glastonbury was amazing, which was the John Peel tent. Nice. But if you do the John Peel tent, it's like it's full of serious music fans. Whereas second time we did the main stage, and then it gets more into being like people who are just there because it's Glastonbury, yeah. and they're just sort of looking at you in a sort of half interested way you know but the, the John Peel tent's great it's like everybody's really on board in there so playing to different audiences like that so to compare those two does it change your approach to set lists and stuff like that do you think okay this is going to be a different audience let's throw in something else um, or do you just stick to your guns I, and go let's hope you yeah by the second album we'd sort of like made a set that was a bit more you know, a bit more accessible to somebody who's not a fan. It was a bit more up tempo and stuff. The first album's really, really laid back, pastoral sounding, um, and so there were hard times on the first album where you don't, you, you only have one album of material to draw from, and like if you you know you need to sort of have something with a bit more balls and you've got nothing to put in there, you know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time when you're an original band. Um, at the start of your career, there's not an awful lot you can do to change the set, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very generally, you'll you'll have like a twelve song album, and there's a couple of songs on there that you know that you can't really go out and do live anyway, you know. We had a few that were just like soundscapes, and it's like mm. can't really. They can't do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's tricky. And, and what happened to the early? So you. you... I know you did a solo album uh, that we're going to talk about in a moment, but um, did, did the band split up officially? Did they just... We never split up officially, really, but Brandon, the singer, um, just he, he said after the second album, he basically put his life in Texas on hold to come over touring with us. And by the second album, like the record label weren't really putting anything in anymore. Um, like well, it, so you know, from from the money end of it, like we had a, a an A and R guy, Billy, who, who who looked after us personally, and he he was always brilliant. He was hundred percent supportive, but you know, in terms of the people behind him, they just said, "There's no singles on this. This isn't going anywhere. We can't mm. give them tour support anymore." So things were fizzling out financially, and Brandon just said, "I can't really come and do another album and tour again." So. 
for a bit we were thinking maybe we can find somebody else but it didn't seem to work to not have him doing it and we just sort of you know yeah it fizzled out it never it, it, it was never an official end but and did members of the earlys get involved in your solo stuff or was that a kind yeah of a... we all do everything together so cool um there's a my brother was on saxophone and flute in that um and uh you know, everything I've done in production and stuff, he's, he's been involved in. Um, so what's your brother's story? Is he, uh, is he a full-time musician? Does he do other He's stuff? doing a bit of teaching now as well, yeah. but um, at the time the earlys got signed, he was in the police, actually. He, really? He, he joined the uh, London Metropolitan Police, but I, I actually... I thought you meant the bank. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I signed him up. He, he didn't have a job. So I went on the internet and put him in the police. Um, I, I like put his details in and yeah. like, he got a package through the post and he just filled it in and went for it so it, was, it became like this this dare that went horribly wrong because Nicky was a policeman <laughs> but, you know, yeah yeah he saw it through for a while and wow. then we got the deal and we were all going off on tour and he's a policeman so he had to quit and then I mean he enjoyed it in that a must way. be a difficult decision for him well he was starting to have fun because he had that pass where you can get on the tube for free and stuff and you know <laughs> he could arrest somebody when we were out drinking <laughs> you know that was always good fun but yeah he, he, wanted, he wanted to be on tour yeah so it's hard um, yeah and Nicky's a great sax player and a, a, a good producer and engineer and um, we had Sarah on keyboards and vocals who's my sister-in-law right. um, so she's done a few albums since and we all played on those um, John Mark has done a few albums since he did a, a revival hour one and one called The Old Fire. They were great albums. We all got involved in them. So nice. It's like we all we all we all just play on each other's things really. We sometimes bring in other people as well. It's not exclusive, but we all help each other out and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> on your um, so on your Bandcamp page so for the album The Wrecking Place, um, there's a uh, you've got a list of everyone who plays on it at the bottom. It says someone from the internet on tuba. I think it is. I was like, like little trombone. Yeah, I, I, I just someone from the some I, guy on the internet. <laughs> I, I went on Fiverr.com. Yeah, I've done that. I, I, yeah. I was sat there like, um, and I was just thinking, I wonder what. I, and I know loads of trombone players, and, and so they're probably annoyed with me that I, I gave somebody probably three three pound fifty to. But it was like it was like a five second thing, and I just thought I just need to see how this five second sounds on trombone. And I asked this guy to do it, and I, I can't remember his name or anything. Yeah, I didn't know him last year. He's exactly the same. I can't remember the name. <laughs> you know, it's effective. It worked all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think I'll do that again, though. It's tight. It is a bit tight, isn't it? Giving someone three pounds. But you know, there's people. No, but there's people on there who say they're earning like sixty grand a year just from doing that. I don't know how they're doing it. I know how many hours a day. It's the they're extras, working. isn't it? Yeah, must be. Yeah, but yeah. let's talk about one song on there that absolutely blew me away. I can't get enough of this song called "Everybody Get in Line." <laughs> what a fucking tune! So tell us about that song. Where, where did that come from? How did you get that? Yeah, together. Uh, I, I wanted to do something that sounded like a, a, a Northern Soul um, organ instrumental with that one, really, like, a, like the old Earl Van Dyke tunes and things like that, uh, Windy K Frog. And then, so, so like, I was, I, I was just getting that stomping, Stax kind yeah. of stomping rhythm, and, and like, I came up with a chord progression on it, and then I started, uh, yeah, playing about with little bits and melodies and lifting things from here and there. And then I, I, I sort of, I took a Booker T and the MG's um, modulation pattern. I basically copied what he does on Hang and High in right. terms of so just two verses in E, then moves up to F, then F sharp, then G. Yeah. So I exactly nicked that really, but uh, you can hear that. It keeps it sort of yeah. building in intensity. I definitely wanted to do something that sounded like Booker T, and uh, so that was the one where I got closest on that because yeah, a lot of the other ones are a bit. There's, there's, there's for just for a few seconds in it, there's this amazing guitar piece on it that is like the sleaziest, filthiest sounding guitar sounds amazing. I've been trying to get that guitar sound for years. Who did that and how did you get that he, sound? He did, uh, he, it was a guy called Scott Pauley from Liverpool who's an amazing guitarist. and He played pedal steel on, on, on the other tracks as right. well. Uh, and so I asked him to do a solo and he sent it back and it sounded totally clean and... Right. You know, a bit like a cropper kind of sound. Yeah. Probably cleaner, so I just said to Nicky, can you make that sound horrible? 
I can't remember what he stuck it through, but he just basically fucked it up. Somehow, yeah, it's so. filth, but yeah. it sounds so good. It's so like, it just sounds yeah. like it's coming through a busted speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Love that tune, and another track, the last track. Is it Taktarov? Is that how you yeah, say it? yeah, 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 Taktarov. Named after UFC six champion Oleg Taktarov, the right. Russian bear. Right, right, okay. That tune. So that's the last track. It's about six minutes long. It's amazing, amazing tune. The sounds are so well selected on that. I found it seems to be that you put a lot of attention to that kind of thing. The bass is incredible on that. Is that a synth or is that that one? Yeah, that's the Moog oh, Voyager. Wow, yeah, yeah. sounds so good. I've got a lot of synths, but since I got that one, I don't. I've had that for like about 13 years now, but I don't really turn on many others really because it's just so good. So you said about the, so that song title was named after UFC Fighter, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so when you're writing, because the whole album is instrumental, do you have lyrics in mind? Do you have a concept, an idea of what this song is about or is it just uh, what flows out of you? A lot of time, yeah, because I, I do some of them based around improvisations and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm thinking of something, yeah. Um, I mean, because I, there's, there's, there's some daft titles on that, but they're, they're like, uh, yeah, they, they only become fully formed titles at the end. And it's, you know, some reference to some kind of life experience that that amuses me. Right, okay. So when you're, when you're, so some of that is kind of improvised, you said, but is there times when you're writing stuff that you're trying to convey through music that you want people to interpret? in the same way as people interpret lyrics in their own way, you know what I mean? So is there yeah. a meaning behind it? Is there emotion? Is there, or is it just whatever comes out? Um, yeah, it's a bit of both. It's, it's not devoid of like emotional input, but um, because instrumental stuff, you're definitely going to start with like, I want to do a sort of, uh, you know, uh, Afro beat 12, eight sort of thing, you know, or, I want to do a Northern Soul tune or whatever, you know. Uh, so some of them, you know, they start with a loop or an idea like that. Yeah. There's one on there where it's like, definitely, I want to do one in seven. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, I don't know. Probably maybe some people just sit down and start thinking about an emotion, but like, I, I think about what kind of piece of music I want to make first. Gotcha. gotcha. And then the sort of emotional content flows from there afterwards, I think. So you mentioned Booker T there, um, obviously uh, an influence on some of your stuff, and you worked with Crawford, is that right? So we had we had Steve Crawford on the podcast. Only a bit. On the, on the only a bit. Like, past, I, I did a us. couple of gigs with him um, a, a few years ago. He, um, there's an agent from round here. He, he lives in Clitheroe actually, called Pete Barton, who sort of puts out a lot of he, those bands from the sixties and seventies where there's one one guy left, and uh, <laughs> you know. So he's been running a version of the Animals for years, which has ended up just being the drummer, John Steele. And the keyboard player is Mickey Gallagher, who played with the Animals for a while in the 60s, yeah. after Alan Price, and then went on to be in the Blockhead. So he's a fantastic keyboard player. Yeah. And so I've stood in for Mickey a couple of times over the years, and then they ended up doing some touring with Steve Cropper. So and I stood in on, on that when Mickey couldn't do it as well. And where, where was that? Was that in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I only did a couple, but it, you know, it meant a lot to me because I'm such a big Booker T and the MGs fan, 
and like some of the first music that I got into was Otis Redding as well when I was a teenager. So to be playing Dock of the Bay with Steve Cropper. You know. As good as it gets. I yeah. mean, with with um with that, did you rehearse with him, or was it a case that you just kind of thrown in and you you expected to uh, know the stuff? Yeah, but I did know. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that in my sleep. I know. <laughs> and um, so you took. T- what what surprised you about his process, about how he works? You know, what again? What would a musician learn from working with him? From your well, he, he, point? he's from that um sort of classic era of players who've just you know he is being himself and nobody else he's not you couldn't get him to go out and say do something a bit like Steve Vai on, on this he can only be Steve Cropper and that's brilliant he's absolutely found his own voice you know he doesn't even really seem to know what he's doing in terms of chords or notes or anything he knows what will work he knows where his hands usually go and he you know I think a really big thing that struck me is for guitarists, I'm not a guitarist, so I might be talking out of turn, but a lot of guitarists spend so many years chasing the sound, like trying to change amps, change guitars. Yeah, this yeah. isn't right. I need to sound more like that guy. I'll get the same stuff as him. And it never works out. And then you see Steve Cropper playing a PV guitar using one <laughs> of those red knobbed um, fenders from the 80s that everybody hates. And he still sounds like Steve Cropper. He sounds yeah. more like Steve Cropper than anybody else can. And it's all in the fingers. So much is in the fingers. And it's like, I don't know, if you could pass that on to everybody when they're younger, you know, focus on yourself rather than the instrument. The instrument's your means of expressing yourself, but the music comes from you. And it's like, sort that part of it out first. It's a bit of a tough one to tell keyboard players because actually you will sound better on a hand and organ. Yeah, that's true, yeah. But like for guitarists, you know, you can sort of, Polish what's coming out with uh, out of you first before you spend thousands on chasing somebody else's sound, you know. So Cropper came on the podcast a couple of years ago, and um, we've got an hour and a half of him talking about all this stuff. So he's an absolute legend. Co-wrote sitting on the dock of the bay, loads of amazing stories. So, so do check that if you haven't heard it yet. Um, actually, one of the songs I wanted to talk about about the earlies, I've just remembered. One of us is dead. Uh, yeah, what a beautiful song that is! Tell us yeah. about tell us about that. What that's John about? Mark. Um, I mean, for a guy who doesn't really play an instrument, you know, he can come in sometimes with just a fully formed idea of like right. what he wants, and he's like. And how does he convey that to you? What he would just sing the melody to you, and you'd work around what the chords. Yeah, would be? So, I mean, yeah. I think he came up because the chords to that one are just like it's just like going down the tone and back up. So it's like it's only got two chords in it. So. Yeah. It was easy for him to sort of mess around with that. Um, but then, yeah, he'll have had to convey the melody to Brandon. And he can't sing really either, but he's, he sort of manages to get get stuff across and he, he's, he'd come up with an entire lyric for it and he'd, um, he'd cut up samples from, from the eulogy from his grandma's funeral in the middle and uh, done all these sort of very speeded voices sort of mm. going off in all sorts of stereo effects in the middle. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful piece of music, that, you know. Yeah, it really is. Um, so talking about playing live, um, when you're sound checking and you're getting everything that you, you need before a gig, what is it that you personally need to feel confident going on stage from a sound perspective? I'm really unfussy on that front. A bit because, because I had so many of those early experiences as a player in, you know, less than ideal mm-hmm. circumstances... Uh, I'm not that fussy, and also because with keyboards, you know that it's just gonna, it's gonna just sound like it sounds out front, and it's nothing to do with getting the, the right amp sound or anything like like it is for guitarists. So the only thing I really need is just to be able to hear the drummer, really. And actually, I like bass so that all the harmonies grounded. But you know, I don't need need loads of anything really. Do you? Um, is it easy enough to convey what you want in your own? Did you say so you're using it in With ears? With Liam, we're using yeah. ears, yeah. I've never used them before. And how, how's that how's that adapting to those? Um, it's all right. It's actually, my ears were starting to get, they, they were hurting quite a lot before I started this. And after having a year of having protection in it, it's like, feels like they're recovering a bit. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, but, and, and if you want more or less of something, is it easy for an engineer to do that without affecting what Liam wants? I mean, it, it won't affect it, but it's, it is hard to get it across because, like, you've got two hands on the keyboard, so yeah. you're on the other side of the stage from the 
monitor engineer, so you can't like wave at him, and you can't really convey anything. So I, I just leave it. If I'm having a bad one on the sound, I just sort of trust that, you know, I've put enough work in at the rehearsals and stuff that it's it's gotta be fine, you know. And they're, they're you know they're looking at Liam and trying to make sure he's happy. <laughs> I'm I'm bottom of the of the ladder up there, you know. So. <laughs> and um, how do acoustics differ from venue to venue when you're on stage? I know as an audience it can change, but when you're on stage, does well, it... if you've got in ears in, they don't really. Um, I think for Liam, because he's not wearing in ears, he, he you know he has a better gig when it's bigger, and especially we've had a couple of gigs where there's been like uh, like a concrete wall across and it's bouncing back, and he, he he's really enjoyed those ones where it's just sort of massive and loud and all around you. you know. Um, smaller gigs and dead stages and stuff like that he's really not into what uh, do you mean by dead stages well you, know, you get some sort of acoustically treated places that um, they basically try and get rid of all reflections and so that the sound's true out front right we did one in um, Amsterdam the other week and it was like you know no parallel walls right a, new, a brand new PA where there's nothing coming out of the back of it everything's directed forward and he hated that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was just thinking, they've spent a fortune on this place. And, you know, he, he just wants sort of something a bit more rock and roll, really, you know. Um, uh, I, I actually quite like it when there's dead myself because, because, like, you're getting the sound that you rehearsed with, you know. Um, especially with keyboards now, because uh, you're using a lot of, modeling or sampling or whatever but you want you don't want too much color from an amp or from the room really you actually want it to sound like it sounds when you're all the headphones on yeah. and sort of the deader the room is the more of that you get you know but a lot of i think i think yeah everyone's after different things on that front aren't they absolutely um what techniques have you seen for, for over your years for musicians to deal with that restlessness on the day of a gig so that, you know, the gig's not till the evening. I wouldn't call it nerves, but that kind of like restlessness. What, what do you see people doing? And People and... drink. <laughs> <laughs> they all drink, don't yeah. they? Uh, I mean, yeah. We've got, there's one, pan, one person in the band who doesn't drink, which is Mike. And um, he, 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 he does a lot of going for walks and, uh, meditating a bit and things like that. Um, yeah, me and Dan go and have a couple of pints, which is <laughs> obviously a slippery slope. I don't recommend that to anybody, but you know, you, you, it's a lot easier the bigger the gigs get because you sort of um, you don't really have to do anything until you go on stage, you know. So a lot of the time we don't even have to leave the hotel till seven or right. Nice. It's really easy. <laughs> and do you get any? Not nerves, but do you get? Do you still get that? That I know you said the early ones were a bit kind of frightening, but uh, how, how do you feel on the day of a gig or, or the hours running up to the gig? I don't really feel nervous. I like it, mate. Yeah, you know. Um, it, 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 I've, I've, I've been playing so much for a long time that it just it feels like a totally natural place to be, really. You know, more than normal life. You know, so I'm happy when I'm playing. What's the biggest thing that's gone wrong on a live show in your whole career? And how did you deal with it? In my whole career, is any time, it took me a few goals to realise that you can't use a Hammond organ on a, a generator that's not giving you a constant cycles output. So <laughs> if you, you know, if you plug into like one of these smaller, cheaper generators, it'll sound kind of in tune, but it's very slowly drifting in and out. And uh, so the first time I ever did that was at a festival. And it, and I only had my Hammond organ with me, so I couldn't switch to another instrument. And the guitarists were just trying to tune the guitars to the Hammond, and it kept going lower and lower really slowly till the strings were just hanging loose. Um. And nobody could figure out what was happening. And then <laughs> at three quarters of the way through the gig, I, I remembered that I'd read somewhere that you can't <laughs> really use it on generators. So that, that was horrible. It just like a... A seasick. It's just going like, uh, oh shit, what do you do there? Uh, <laughs> and, you just, and, and so you just keep hearing it wobble, what, what wobble, and you're thinking, is that me? My ears just turned to shit. And it just, yeah. 
And I, I think I did it about two or three times. I did it that once. I was like, must never do that again. And then we went and played at the Green Man Festival with the Earlies. Yeah, 2007, I think that was. Yeah. Well, the first one we did was oh, okay. 2005 or something like that. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, plugged it in and again it was like, I'm looking around at, <laughs> at the other guys. I'm like, is, is, that, is that shit? <laughs> so next time we did it. The green man, I didn't Because you headlined, I think, a couple of years later. Yeah. Oh, we were like second from the top. Or something right. Like that. But yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that's probably the worst thing that's ever happened. Because most things that happen, you'll sort out quite quickly. Oh, that's not working. Right. Use something else. But that was one that just kept persisting through the gig. And I was, I was refusing to stop playing it. Like, so I was probably just ruining every song all the way through, <laughs> you know. So what are the common denominator? What is the common denominator to great gigs? Um, there's no logic to it really because I think any musician probably knows how you have these gigs where you think that this is the one that matters. There's a record label coming down, or this person from the, another band's coming down, or there's some press in, and you give yourself a lot of pressure, and you do a shit gig. And everybody's had those ones where you're playing in a bar somewhere and there's one guy in and you all look at each other and think, ah, oh, let's just do it anyway. And you yeah. just have the best night of your lives. So a lot of the time, they're the ones that come out of nowhere where, you, where there's no pressure on it and you just sort of, um, you know, you all relax and you enjoy each other and the music and you properly communicate with each other and the focus isn't on what's out there. So I suppose that's maybe the factor. What's been your favourite ones of this kind of period with, with Liam? What's, what's been the highlights of live performances in the last year or so? Um, like uh, early on, like the first one was really special because that was just after the bomb in Manchester and it was a, an emotional night for the people of Manchester and it was a big deal for us because it was the first one. Uh, and it let you know what you were going to be in for because it was almost academic before that you were just sort of in a room rehearsing with this guy who you sort of knew was a celebrity but you'd stop thinking about it after a bit and you just played some songs and then you just realise how big he is and how much he matters to people and how much those songs matter to people so and then after that again like the the Glastonbury one yeah I was at that amazing that, that was somebody said to me like afterwards that you look like you were facing the Uruk High or something like it, you know, the orcs in Lord of the Rings. And you just looked out at this mad crowd with flags and flares, flares all on yeah. top of each other and tops off and stuff. And so you'd look out at that and then you'd look around the stage and David Beckham's there and Stormzy. And so there's, you can't look at the sides of the stage because that's full of famous people. And you can't look out front because that's just chaos. And so we were just looking at each other and grinning and... <laughs> terrified you know so yeah that was another one where you just sort of started that, that was just like being in the middle of a hurricane or something and a couple of those early festivals were like that and um and then the, the first arena gigs were amazing as well because that's just like watching a riot belfast was absolutely yeah. crazy you know so yeah uh, just and it, it keeps going up a level most bands you do in your life starts out full of promise and then you do a tour and the money runs out and everything gets a bit more depressing. And This is one that just actually keeps on exceeding expectations. So. And headlining summer festivals this year as well. Yeah, uh, and, and then like, you know, and stuff the like arena's that. sold out in five minutes. and then Finchy Park sold out. Yeah, right? that, so every time they take it up a level, it delivers. So it'll just, you know, hopefully carry on like that. Um. You've worked with some very powerful people in the music industry. What's their biggest weakness? Um, well, I mean, the more famous people get, it's probably the biggest weakness is, is that nobody's ever saying no to them or telling them whether their ideas are good or bad. So I suppose... Yes, men. Yeah, you can get surrounded by too many yes men. Um, I think, yeah the longer your career is successful, the more it goes on. So, yeah, you don't, you're not getting enough outside help, I think, the more successful you are. Or criticism, you know. Yeah. Um, 
it's still about working in the studio and um, recording. I know something that you focused a lot in the early's was to record live takes and you used to do everything live. Is that right? A lot of this. Did you uh, no, there was a lot of there was a lot of in, in the early's there was a lot of um, lengthy improvisations that got sort of chopped up. We did let, let you know. Okay. There was a lot of meandering. <laughs> And looking at it afterwards. In regards to live takes, you you produce you must have produced some live stuff in the past, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really lucky to have started recording just in the period where people were still using tape. Um, yeah. So, you know, because Pro Tools has changed the way everybody behaves in the studio. When you go in to do something now, everybody just says, "I'll do about five takes, and we'll just comp it." You know? Yeah. And so, if you're working with a band who who are, um you know you want to capture what they do best and what they do best is live how would you go about doing that so that you still don't get the bleed and that kind of thing because you see bands that you know maybe get into a studio and it doesn't quite work so well so you do it live and then you've got that issue as well what would you do you've got to stop worrying about bleed really and and realize that actually a lot of the classic recordings that you really love that is actually part of what's making them sound good you get as long as you're managing it properly you get a lot of atmosphere from bleed Uh, like People got into this thing of recording drums with uh, individual mic on every drum, top and bottom, and sort of trying to isolate each one so it sounds like it was recorded in a vacuum. Mm. And then you get somebody who just sticks one mic in front of a kit and it sounds better. And it's because you're not having to sort of rebuild a drum kit sound afterwards from all these components. You've just got one. You know, so... um, You can... If a band's good and they know how to play it together, um, you can stick a mic anywhere in the room and it should sound good, you know. Uh, if, you, if you like the band. Yeah, yeah. If, if you like, yeah, if you see them recording the, uh, the, the band, the Brown album, um, and they did it all in the, this pool house that they, they rented, and you can see rehearsal takes of them, and they sound almost like the finished recordings because they played together so well, you know. They're not, nobody's drowning anybody else out. Everybody's listening to each other. So it's like eliminating spills the wrong way to go about it. It's just making sure that everything that's, every noise that's being made is a good sounding one, you know. I think there's people who are doing that really well nowadays, isn't there? Like uh, the Dap Kings do. Right, okay. You know, they'll record the guitar and the bass onto one track. <laughs> through one mic and really they, yeah and then you know if they want more bass they turn the bass on that channel up and if they want more <laughs> guitar they turn the treble on that channel up you know right and they'll record the drums into one mic on the floor behind the kit really and the recordings sound amazing so it's like interesting and then I, I remember reading an interview with Ethan Johns once where he was saying um, like it, basically if you've got so if you recorded everybody in one room together and you've got the vocal mic in the middle of the room and the drums are going into the vocal mic as well. That sound that you're getting of the drums in the vocal mic kind of informs the drum sound that you're going to get for the recording. So you just, you know... Again, if you've got a good wow. sounding kit and it's spilling through, it doesn't matter. If your tom sound crap and they're all over everything, then you've got a problem. Yeah. And yeah, it also, it becomes less of a problem if you're not doing loads of drop-ins and that. If you know that it's going to be the finished recording... And that everybody's doing the take, then spills not as much of an issue as if you start. And vocals, would you always do them afterwards? Most people would. Yeah. It depends what kind of singer you're dealing with. Yeah. There's no right or wrong with that, but you know, like if you've got John Lennon screaming "Don't Let Me Down," yeah. out, it, you know, again, that's going to be fine covered in spill. His voice is going to be powerful enough to carry it. But you can have lots of brilliant singers who just sing a lot quieter. I don't, don't suppose there's as many screamers around no. nowadays because so many people are trying to do speech level singing. Um, what are other examples of kind of unique production techniques that you've seen either to get the best out of an individual's performance or kind of um, creative ways of, of picking up a particular sound, picking up a particular sound? Uh, hang on. Create, creative production yeah, techniques? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or unique production techniques to get the best out of someone or to get a particularly good sound or something. But I, I was just thinking, like, there's, there's, there's a couple of um, vocal things, isn't there? Like, uh, I've, seen, I've, I've seen producers who, like, look for the 
side of the face that different singers sing out of because everybody sort of leans more to one side. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I think that first turned up in that. Have you ever read Mixing With Your Mind? Uh, no. It's an Australian producer called Stav. It's nicknamed Stav, but I can't remember. I'll have to find out um, what that's called. But there's a couple of tips in there. He, he has some some really interesting ones. Like So finding which side of the face a singer favours is a big one for the position of mics. Wow. Um, his, t- his technique for getting a drum sound, a good drum sound, is always to be informed by the floor tom. Like find, basically find the point in the room where the floor tom sounds good and then everything else... You know, because the floor tom's always the worst sounding drum in the game. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a few interesting ones in that. Any of those sort of Brian Eno oblique strategies are good. Like the first couple of people I made records with, um, I thought they were being really clever, and then it just turned out they were basically ripping off Brian Eno all the time. Really? Such as? What were they doing? Uh, oh, I mean, John Mark always used to be coming out with things like, <laughs> play as though you're playing to a baby or whatever <laughs> you, you know yeah. like uh, yeah but basically sort of giving non-musical directions uh, but I think not that he was directly ripping Eno off but you know I think that all, all those things are sort of um, influenced by that I know I talked to a, uh, an engineer once who'd worked on an Eno session and he said that Basically, Brian Eno just came into the studio in the morning, put coloured lights all around the room, and then left and wasn't there for any other session. <laughs> and I said, that sounds like bollocks. And he said, well, I can't guarantee that I, you know, that I would have done the session in the same way had he not been in with the coloured lights. But, you know, I don't have, know. Have you ever, f- not fallen for any of these, but have you ever been on the receiving end of some of these that you weren't... Uh, well, no, n- not them. Uh, another thing that we've all done, um, and in fact I did it on, on that album of mine, is um, sort of a, you're getting people to improvise. Sometimes it's interesting to actually take out anything that's influencing them and have them think they're doing something completely different, you know. So like removing old drums and stuff like that, you get a looser improvisation out of somebody. Or like give them a couple of bars and then let them go off on their own, you know. So, um, oh, you know, with the earlies, we did stuff like where we would have somebody recording something over a half-time version of... Uh, there's a t- tune on that first album, uh, Irvid Song. Uh, it's about the third or fourth. In, and yeah. There's a lot of, like, wonky-sounding rhythms being played by people on that, and it's because they were improvising over something completely different. And it sort uh, of gives you this feel that's, yeah. you know... Just totally not what musicians would do. What bad habits do you have as a musician that you would teach a young musician not to do? Oh, uh, I've got loads of bad habits. I've got terrible, like terrible posture. Right. Um, I, my hands are bad on the keyboard. So everybody who learns classically does, does all this sort of balancing pencils and pennies on the back of their hand and like, <laughs> if they did that on mine, it would be a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What else do I do? I bite my nails to keep them short. I probably shouldn't do that. About uh, your posture, does that is that cause issues in the past? Like you spoke, obviously, I'm guessing you're supposed to sit really upright, but you probably to yeah slouch over a bit. Yeah. Uh, just trying to think. But definitely, like in the technical side of it, it's all wrong because I I, I taught myself before I went any anywhere near any kind of teachers or anything. So I did have I, I, when I was about twenty three. I started having lessons doing classical stuff, um, which was really good. Um, and that that guy, so he, he didn't like throw the baby out with the bathwater, but he did sort of show me a few things differently. Um, and uh, I've had bits of things with people over the years, but you get, when, when you've got to a certain point, these things are just so embedded that it's not even worth trying to repair them, you know, so... Um, I don't think I even would tell anybody not to do them. Yeah. It's only music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. Um, cool. So let's talk about some of the uh, some of the lean stuff. You were telling me earlier about um, so there's a song that you've really beefed up from the original version, which was done by Billy called "Soul Love." Tell us about how you would approach that. So if, if Liam, you know, sends you a text said, "Learn this song," how do you guys get together and and, and work on a song? That well, you, that, you don't so know? yeah, as I was telling you that it was when we were playing in Soul, so. Um, 
you know, about 11 in the morning, he's probably, maybe even earlier, he goes for his run in the morning and thinks of an idea. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, we'll do soul love because we're in soul. And then every, Mike and Jay were sort of panicking and going to each other's uh, hotel rooms with the guitars and figuring it out. But obviously I can't get anywhere near any keyboards until the actual gig. Yeah. So I just sort of... Uh, I mean, I've got a few things I do on the organ that always sound pretty psychedelic. So I went for that during the verses and I stuck some Mellotron in because he, he likes Mellotron, so I'm not going to offend yeah. any sensibilities with that, you know. Um, but when you don't actually get to rehearse it... Um, so you just did it at the sound check, right? And then... Yeah, I think we just, we just sound checked it and then did it that night. And then it, it made it into a few gigs, but not loads, but it's a really nice tune, that. It's good. It sounds really, really good. Like, um, so it's beefed up. What do you mean by that? It's like, is it a bit more heavier? Powerful. Yeah, it's heavier, much heavier. That's, it really suits it as well. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the best. You did a version of at Reading, and the version of it is brilliant. I listen to it a lot. It's like a really, really kind of beefed ah, up. Ah, did we do it at Reading? Yeah, powerful, powerful sound. <laughs> So you came along for the ride. Yeah. And had a pretty good time. I did. I did. <laughs> like the, Liam just talked. I was uh, under, yeah, instruction from the top, come along and get leathered. So I, I, I did. Because, um, <laughs> like, the tour manager at the time basically said, yeah, uh, it's going to be straight on and off. There's no time for keyboards. And, you know, so, so I was just stood at the side. And, uh, yeah, I did. I, 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 was, I was falling about the place, really. Good, good fun, good fun. And um, was it like on the private jet flying over quickly? Was it all a bit last minute and kind of panicky, or were the guys pretty chill? No, that was a uh, that. I mean, that was that was a uh, you know one of those moments where you realise that you're onto a, a next level kind of thing. I think Drew said to me a couple of days later about something. He said, "You've changed, Madden." And I said, "I changed the minute I got on that private jet, and I don't want to change back." <laughs> I'm staying like that, but they're not that good, you know. Actually, they're, they're very small, and they feel they feel a bit. They're a bit scary, actually. I mean, it's something that tiny, you know. I was yeah. facing the wrong way as well. Oh, yeah. Because some of the seats face backwards, so then you set off, and you're like, "This is no good on on, on a podcast, is it?" But <laughs> <laughs> the race up. Yeah, your yeah. back's going up into the air. Yeah. Oh wow. Bit weird, but yeah. It's free beer on them, but it should be. They cost a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let's talk wall of glass. So when you started doing that, it didn't have the uh, harmonica sample, I don't think. On yeah. It. Um, so did you? Are you kind of queuing that sample? Was that something? Yeah, that... that's something. I mean, I would have never done that like um, six years ago or something. I don't. One of the last people I worked with before this was Jimmy Goodwin from Dubs. Yeah. And, um, Great musician. You know, he's, he's an amazing musician. Uh, Plays everything. He's a drummer. He's a guitarist. He's a bassist. He's singer. brilliant. Yeah. He's a very intuitive musician, and he's like. You know, he's into everything. Um, you know, you don't meet many guys in indie circles who can talk about jazz fusion and old soul and funk and, you know, it's hip hop. He's like, he's all over it. He comes from a sampled background, really. He's like, yeah. you know, he's more from a, what Sub Sub was like a dance yeah. thing, you know. That's pre Doves, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. But like, um, when, when we were doing things with Jimmy, there was a lot of samples involved and, I would do stuff like uh, we played Snowden by Doves and I had all the string parts just chopped up into little pieces. So we weren't doing it to a click, but I was like triggering it a bar or half a bar at a time, just these little pieces of strings. So when it came to Wall of Glass and we didn't really have anybody to play the harmonica, I just sort of cut it into pieces and just, you know, trigger, trigger a section of it at a time. It's never, you know... It missed it, it missed it though at the beginning. It does need it. I yeah, think, yeah. It. yeah. Well, we just thought it's kind of like 
it's instantly that tune when you hear the harmonica, and if, if, if it's just a rhythm guitar part, it takes everybody until the singing starts to know what's going on. And as it was a single, it felt a bit more important to convey what it is, you know. Because you play a bit of that, so in the middle you play some nice little kind of honky-tonk piano kind of thing in the middle, don't you, in the bridge? Uh, or water glass? No, uh, no. I have done, I've done, um, when we've done it acoustically, yeah, I, yeah. I, I've, I've sort of, I've done something that's a bit like the harmonica part because we've just been, uh, I've done that like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I did that because that's sort of like uh, what the guitar, that, that's like an electric part that Mike's doing at the gig, but when we're doing it acoustic, if they'd like try and get any of the uh, electric lines across, it's sort of like the arse drops out of everything if you stop playing chords to do a little, yeah. you know, so it sort of works for the piano to step in on that, you know. Good tuning, you played that on um, Howard Stern, didn't you? What was that like going on the Howard Stern show and stuff like that? That, that, must was, be quite that a... was the best interview I've ever had Liam do, it just like... And Howard Stern was quite probing, um, you know, he's asking him a lot about his childhood and his dad and his relationship with Noel, and he's just one of those days where Liam was just up for talking about everything, he was really funny and, you know, telling the story about pissing on Noel's um, stereo and stuff yeah. like that, it was, it was great. Yeah. And then afterwards we come off and somebody said, 32 million people were listening to that and you just... Don't think about it because you're just in a room with like this funny guy, you know. How would that affected your performance subconsciously or consciously if you someone had said beforehand 32 million people are going to be listening to what you're about to play? I think you would certainly feel a bit of pressure to not fuck up, you know. Um, I don't. Yeah, out of all the things, actually, I think everybody I talk to, musicians, also always say that radio makes them feel more nervous than every, anything, and it's like it's ridiculous to think that. Um, because everything lives forever now. Like every gig you do goes on YouTube and stays there forever. Every mistake you make is. So why is that thing, do you think? I don't know. Maybe it's because you can't see the people who are listening to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, but it's weird, but everybody seems to feel the pressure on radio. They don't on TV. You know, it's weird. I got Katy Perry in an headlock, but I, I didn't know who she was, to be fair. Uh, I don't think it would have changed whether I got her in a headlock or not, but it's just this weird sort of over-sincere American um, turning up dressed like a Buck Rogers extra. And, uh, <laughs> she just sort of was going on t telling Liam that he's like the last true, genuine artist, that he's so real. And then um, somebody... Like a photographer came up and said, uh, and she said, oh, these guys don't want photographing with me, they'll lose their cool. And I said, come on, you can have a photo with Madden. And I grabbed hold of her and she said, why don't you just get me in a headlock or something? And, and she barely finished saying it and I had her under my arm. And then I said, I told her to clear off. And I, I, she, I don't know. But I had no idea who she were. I just thought she was some, yeah, a bothersome dancer or something like that. And then... There were a few funny things going on there that night because everybody was pop. 
and we were we were the only. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. even Coldplay were there. Yeah. Uh, but you know. Yeah. Um, they 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 sort of they're, they're a bit more like in that pop camp. Um and it, yeah, Mike said it was a bit like when Nirvana turned up on the scene. Um, you know, at, at the start of the nineties. Like everybody who was doing rock music was dressed like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly Nirvana just turn up and, and they're really good and they're just dressed normally. Yeah. And so I suppose Liam turning up when everybody else is in sparkly clothes and stuff and then he just turns up in a parka and is the best thing on it. It was great. And it sort of, it gave it, 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 it grounded it in Manchester really because mm. I don't know. I was a bit, uh, I was in a bit two minds about that whole thing of just having a, a tribute concert so close to the actual event where when people were still in hospital and stuff like that you know but I think it seemed to be a pretty sincere event in the end you know could go back and tell myself when I was younger it would be like to that you can only do a good job of the job that's in front of you right now and so if you're doing a gig that you think oh, I'm not really into this this isn't my kind of music or whatever and you go on stage and you're giving it anything less than your best and you're being a bit miserable nobody in the audience knows that you're usually in another band that's totally cool and mm. you're just standing in on this and this isn't your kind of thing you know, if you're shit, they're just going to look and see a miserable shit guy on stage. And so you should, you know, you can only you can only be good by doing a good job of the thing that's in front of you right then. I think other stuff that's took me ages to understand is like um, people, t- uh, people tell you laws when you're younger. It's not what you play. It's what you play. Uh, it's what you don't play. Yeah. And it takes you years to understand the reality of that, of like, you know, of le- leaving spaces in a it, just in your phrasing even something like uh that that tune you're on about everybody get in line um it took me a few goes of, of, of playing that to realize that i had to leave some even though it's quite a constant melody there had to be spaces in the phrasing of it it had to breathe like if a brass player had done it or something yeah it's, it's a good thing for keyboard players because you can actually play it forever just waggling your fingers so it's a good idea to sort of breathe out while you're doing a phrase so that you have to stop. Interesting. You know. Um, what's been the biggest struggle in your career? Um, generally, it's just earning a living, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, there's such a constant, you know, and every year, this has been a really good job. It's, it's lasted well and it's gone right over that Christmas bump. But every year you come round to January the 1st and you've nothing in for the first couple of months and you just think, is this the year that I have to stop doing this? So mm-hmm. I think every other struggle is secondary compared to that financial one, you know. How do you balance that fear, if it is a fear, or that kind of anxiety around that and making sure that you pursue what it is you're good at and your uh, well, it's that same thing I was just saying about making sure that you do a good job of what's in front of you. I think, you know, 
I've, I've had times where I've had nothing in the diary and I end up doing a few things just for free and you never know where they'll end up leading you or who you'll meet or whatever. And so you've just got to make sure that you... Uh, oh, I read the phrase the other day. It was a good one. It was in this book at the back. Good phrase. Plough dig- diligently and expect no harvest. Nice. What's the book? Now, this is a Hammond book by a guy called Brian Charette. Right, wow. Um, but yeah. Because so it's interesting, because that, that fear, I think, that come from? He says it's an old, old Taoist mantra. Right. Plough diligently and expect no harvest. So just, yeah, do the best you can of everything that comes up in front of you and expect nothing for it. Uh, like back to that thing of being at the start of the earlys and going and recording with with John Mark and Giles I like I didn't think it was going anywhere and they weren't giving me any money and I just went over and gave them everything I had over and over again you know they'd buy me like a curry or something like that yeah um cool so now you've got to the level I'm guessing that you wanted what's your motivation now from a creative perspective um There, there, you know, there, 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 there is, um, I just want to have a body of work that when I'm finished that I can look back at and feel some kind of pride in. And I've, I've, I've got like, I've got a bit of a recorded body of work, but you know, I would like to just have a bunch of solo albums down. Good. I mean, I, I, I'm always interested in playing with other people and uh, I'm always just interested in getting better, so... You know, still learning. So, reflecting back on your career today, how did it pan out differently to what you expected before you entered the music industry, and what you thought the music industry would be like and look like? I think most people of my age who sort of grew up in the in the nineties, uh, and if you were a musician, then you had to look back to the sixties and seventies because, like, in the early nineties, everybody who was famous was a DJ. Yeah. And so I ended up looking that bit further back to where everyone's playing classic instruments and all the photos are in black and white and everybody looks cool. And you have this idea of what what being in the music industry is going to be like and it's based on this 20-year out-of-date model. Mm. And when you get there, uh, I mean, especially if you, if you come from a northern northern town you'll you, you go into an industry that doesn't have many people like you in it you know there's a lot of people with generic southern accents university educated people who do music as a sort of gap year thing until they get the yeah. job as director of a charity or working at the bbc or something yeah. like that and um you don't meet many people who are in it for life who are you know serious about it like that and then the, I think the biggest change is the the, the thing of um, artists having to be sort of accessible and public constantly that's uh social media has changed what it is to be in a band how well people are sort of busy creating all sorts of content other than music <laughs> yeah. you know I mean if you think about somebody like Prince and what he put out in his life uh, you know, you wonder how successful that would have been if from the off he was having to curate a Twitter feed and a Facebook page and take interesting pictures for Instagram, you know. He was he was making so much music. Or somebody like Frank Zappa, just yeah. the out- output of people like that was incredible. And it's like, yeah, that all the stuff that surrounds music has become more important than the music itself. So that's a bit of a change. It can still be interesting, and there's some people who, who, you know, I mean, I love Liam's Twitter feed. It's hilarious. Yeah. You know. But you don't feel it's taken away from his creative outlet. You know, it's, no, it's no, just no. something he's doing. Oh, it's just a laugh. Funny. I mean, but the thing is, as well, he's not interacting with Twitter all that much. He's like, he's not on there, just the and you know, aimlessly scrolling through his feed. He yeah. just goes on it, shouts at the world, and then locks <laughs> it down. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> um. What are the common personality traits that separate musicians who don't make a living out of the music industry and those who do? Um, I think the other, you know, the main thing that will get you along is like 
you, you can focus on like technique and, and, and scales and, you know, exercises and more and more complicated time signatures. And, and it's like, the things that are probably going to get you jobs are, uh, number one above everything is the ability to get on with people. Um, your sense of taste is going to get you places. Like if you know what the right thing for a song is rather than what you want to do to show yourself off. Yeah. A good understanding of technology and equipment is always really important. Um, you know, a lot of people who are there complaining that they're not getting anywhere. I mean, that, that, that sort of sense of bitterness and entitlement will never, never help you out either, you know. Um, just going to be sort of... Uh, that, 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 that's another thing, I, I suppose, to put in the, in, the, in the bracket of things that it took me a while to learn as well. Like, uh, early on, um, I, I did, like, bits of arranging for people and stuff like that, and, or playing on things for... Th- free and then never getting anything back and I'd start getting more and more annoyed and bitter about that kind of thing and it's like you've just got to you've got to let things go and just be prepared to give your best to every situation because you never know who's going to listen to that and how it's going to get back to you so once once you've decided to do something you shouldn't hold anything back um so yeah carrying that bitterness with you and thinking that you're entitled to more than you've already got will even if you genuinely are in an objective sense it's like it'll hold you back having that kind of unfortunately <laughs> great answer um so we'll begin to wrap up last couple of questions um what's the most important piece of music memorabilia you own um right let's have a think oh my clavinet <laughs> yeah I got given a clavinet off Denny Lane from Wings. Really? I played in it. So that, that was the first band. Well, I, I, after playing with my dad and my various college mates. How did that come about? Why did he give you that? He was sort of, he was rehearsing with a band in the area and then a keyboard player left and, uh, yeah, the drummer knew me and, and, yeah, I got in. And then I, I didn't get on with him brilliantly, to be honest. I was a, a bit young. He was in his mid-50s. Yeah. I think after a while he found me annoying. But then one day he did give me a clavinet, but mainly because he thought it was worthless. So I don't know if that clavinet was in wings. Maybe not, but yeah, I've still got that, so that's a good piece. What else? What other piece of music memorabilia would you um, uh, tell you? Have I got any others? Uh, oh, I've got a signed Odyssey and Oracle. Zombies. Right, nice. Um... Which, yeah, so, well, only Argent and Blundstone have signed it, but that's good enough, that's the, that's the main ones. Um, I got my Hammond signed by James Taylor from the James Taylor Quartet. Nice. Um, I've, got, I've got Cropper to sign a seven-inch of green onions. So that's you? good, I'll keep that. <laughs> what have I got? I've, I've got something off Booker T as well. I can't remember. Oh yeah, I've got a sign, yeah, a sign, well, one of his albums signed, yeah. Oh, I've got a signed Emerson trilogy as well, Keith Emerson, and he's dead now, so, yeah. I've nice. got a few, I don't know what's the most important out of that. It's probably my clavinet though. Nice, like. cool. What would someone learn from working with Liam that they wouldn't learn from working with anyone else? What surprises you about working with Liam? Um, I have never before seen what real celebrity is like so i've been in bands with guys that have got a bit of a public that that like them and people might come up for an autograph or a picture and um, but i've never been around like that intrusive level of celebrity before where you can actually you know go for a drink or walk down the street or anything like that you know go through an airport without being stopped and sometimes, like, if he's in a pub or something, like, a genuine crowd forms around him and everybody's trying to get a photo and stuff like that, so... Um, and how, does I, he, how does he deal with that? I mean, he's always been quite quite nice around that kind of stuff. But he's, pretty, he's pretty good, he's pretty good, but he just, you know, he, he just sort of... He, he can't do it all the time because he'd never get anything else done, so he, he sort of has to manage where, where he's going to be at different times and that. He's always pretty receptive to people coming up to him. And he... he, he um, He's got a lot of time for actual fans, but 
What's happened since selfie culture's developed is you get people who don't actually 100% know who somebody is and don't necessarily care about them, but they will get a selfie just because they can put it on Instagram and show the world that their life's brilliant because they're hanging out with a celebrity, yeah. even if they don't particularly don't even know care who about is. them. Yeah. So that's like, you know, whereas with autographs, it would just be people who actually yeah. were a genuine fan of that person and wanted to keep their autograph. People who hate you will get a selfie of you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of, I don't know, it's probably quadrupled the amount of people that are asking for them. So. What would you learn from that? What would you learn, like, I guess seeing, if, if you know, you're working with a young musician and they were going to get into that kind of level of celebrity and that kind of culture, what could they learn from the way that Liam deals with it? Well, I, I think uh, a, a, a thing for all of us is, because it, like, it, is a, it is a mad world um, that Liam is dealing with with the public every day. Uh, and so the main thing that we can all do is not be... A part of that, and so like you get a lot of people asking you, could you just get him, get him to sign this, or mm. could you just get him to do a little video message for my mate's birthday or me, you know? And, and it's like we need to provide him a space where he's not getting asked to do all those things because he's actually being asked to do them everywhere else. Yeah, you know? and it's like so he needs to be able to come into a rehearsal room and just rehearse and go off to a gig and just do the gig and then afterwards just have a drink and, yeah. and, and for us to not be more of the same, yeah. basically, you know. The escapism away from all Yeah, that. you've got to just work for them. <laughs> and you, yeah, you've got to, like, you know, give them give them what they want. The, the You know, they need to be able to know that when they go on stage that if there's anything to worry about, it's not you lot, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So going from here, you're off to um, America? I believe doing the stuff in America, playing the group, yeah. I think in America. With some Richard shows Ashcroft. America. With Ashcroft, that'd be great. Um, then festivals all over Europe, the Finsley Park show that's going to be amazing. Um, and then uh, other festivals and then a European tour later in the year. So looking forward to all that? Yes, I am. I, I think the Finsbury Park and Old Trafford one would be great. Yeah. We're going back to Japan in September, which we all loved it there. That was, you know, that's an amazing culture yeah. to get to go and visit. Um, and we've got a European tour to finish the year with, so nice. Yeah, plenty going on. Cool. Um, thank you so much for inviting us up, and thanks for appearing on the Stage Left uh, podcast. Um, a pleasure. I absolutely urge listeners to go and check out Christian's Bandcamp page. Uh, check out some of the stuff with the earlies as well. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for appearing on the Stage Left podcast. Thank you. So that was Christian Madden, um, and that was great fun up in Clitheroe, um, spending time with his, him and his family for, for that day. Um, lovely people, and I would urge you to check his uh, stuff out on Bandcamp. Uh, we hope you enjoyed listening, and subscribe for more episodes with the likes of Oasis guitarist Gem Archer on his first interview in five years, uh, Russ Pritchard and Old Gallagher's High Flying Birds on writing a bass line to Sad Song for the first time, um, Mike Rowe, Paul Gallagher, um, Liam's drummer Dan McDougall was, of course, a recent guest. So you can see all those episodes at thestageofpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at the stage of pod like us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash stage of podcast um, and we do this away from two jobs so if you want to buy us a beer for our travels uh, you can do at the stage we'll see you next month